for our refresher of last week, let me just give you a few things concerning the five directives for change. And I can say this because I'm speaking to myself here. I know I can change. People can change. Okay? And so we can develop new habits, godly habits. So the first thing of last week we looked at was to be watchful. To always be on guard for the things that you are not suspecting. In fact, there's so many times in life we expect things to go a certain way and what happens? They don't turn out the way we think they are. Or we're caught off guard because we think certain things are going to happen a certain way. Well, more importantly, be watchful concerning this mind up here, this brain, to guard it against false doctrine, against false teachers, ever being vigilant to protect what goes into this brain. And then last week we looked at also to be firm in the faith. Listen, you're saved. Yes, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. But your faith, listen, it doesn't depend on how you feel. It doesn't depend on your emotions. It depends what? Solely on the word of God. So guard your heart. Guard your heart and the things that are precious to you. Your salvation. Listen, Christians, we are so blessed to be saved. We're so blessed to be forgiven. You see, even though I may have heard it in countless times, I never tire of it. And if you're here today and you're just so tired of hearing it, you need to search your heart. I was telling my wife the other day, I said, look, if there's one thing that energizes me, it's the Word of God. It's what I'm putting my faith and trust in. It's in God. It's in His Word. It's in His Son. It's in the Holy Spirit of God to direct, to lead, to guide me. And then thirdly, we talked about acting like men. You know, and specifically that part that, you know, we look in the Old Testament where Joshua told, not just the men, but he told every one of these people before him to be courageous, to be strong, to be what? To be as God created you to be. Yes, there's going to be some indifference. Not all of us are created the same way. But the thing about it is this, God created you. He created you to be father, the leader of your home, mother, to be that supporter, to be that completer of that husband. You see, there's rank and order and file in God's kingdom. So he says specifically, act like men. Behave like men. Behave what, the way God spoke to you about your behavior. And also to be strong in the Lord. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by whom his spirit saith the Lord. So my strength doesn't rely on me. Yes, I need strength to physically move about, to, you know, do certain things around the house, go to work, that kind of thing, those activities. But listen, I'm looking to the Lord for my spiritual strength. I'm looking to the Lord for my physical strength. See, my dependency. I'm codependent upon God. And Him alone. That's where you, Christian, get your strength from. This is where you get your, your encouragement from. Yes, I'm with God's people. Yes, we get built up in the faith. Yes, we have one another that we can depend on one another, can trust one another. Those things are important. But listen, specifically, I'm looking to Him for that strength, for that power. And then also, which is the verses that's going to hinge on this next part here. Let all that you do be done how? In love. If we can't do it in love, we might as well not do it at all. If it's for gain or selfish reasons, forget about it. It's not going to go any further than the flesh. And so everything I do should be in the motive of love. And that love he refers to is that agape love. That's a love you and I cannot develop. We don't come up ordinarily with this kind of love. God gave us His love through His Son, Jesus Christ, this unconditional agape love that says this, there's not one single thing you have to do for me to love you. Well, don't you love that? And, and you know what else is wrapped up in that love? is the fact that you don't have to perform for God to love you any more than He loves you. Boy, didn't that take the pressure off of you? That your relationship with God is not based on performance. It's on what? On love. So, did, don't raise your hand. 
How many of you blew it this week? I'll raise mine. <laughs> because I know. I understand. So I blew it this week. But here's what's so good. God's unconditional love never stopped loving. God didn't look from heaven and say, Tony, you messed up this week. I'm not going to love you no more. He doesn't do that. Why? Because it's unconditional, and it's not based on performance. I said to my wife, I said, look, hey, I played basketball in high school and, and uh, thought maybe I could go in the, the, the uh, NBA, I can't even say it, and uh, thinking that, you know, maybe I could get a professional rank. I'd try it out for, you know, sub-pro level. I wouldn't like my other brother back there who could go all the way to the top. But so too few many people ever get to be in the professional level. Why didn't I get there? Because I wasn't good enough. <laughs> See, but because I wasn't good enough to play basketball, does that mean God loved me less? No. He still loved me the same. So you see, it's not based on performance. And that, I tell you, that's so liberating. That's the grace of God. That's the agape love of God. So we looked at those five directives for change. And, and, and seriously, I don't know if you thought about any of these things this week, but I, I would encourage you to go back and read those. You know, and do, do a little Bible study on that for your own heart. Because it just gives you such a greater assurance knowing that, listen, God cares deeply about you. And so, you know, he's not, a, he's not a difficult God. He's not a God that you look up in heaven that's always trying to mess up my life. No, he loves you too much to do that. In fact, he wants everything best for your life. Even the things that you think might be best for you, he knows better. Amen? Amen. So, spontaneous faith is our first point, main point here today. And I, if you look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the very first part of that verse in 15, remember, that verse 14 hinges on what he's going to finish up with here in the conclusion of this letter. He says, now I urge you, brother, you know the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Acacia. So, Paul is simply saying the household of Stephanus and others like them exercise practical Christian faith. And remember now, these were the first converts that Paul had led to Christ. And then probably there were some there that had already won, been won to Christ before Paul even got there because news traveled quite rapidly when they learned of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost had been crucified and many people were getting saved. So, but in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, one, he says, oh, I've turned that. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16 says, I did not baptize also the house, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So again, Paul was, in, in other words, in essence, addicted to, to ministry. Now, addiction has a very uh, bad word, a bad reputation today. But according to the Word of God, if we look at it in the context that it's written here, it's a good word. So, when you, as I go through this message this morning, you're going to hear me talk about addiction a lot. But listen, today there are all, all types and kinds of addictions. And many, there are many of them. So if ever you go online and you look at some of these sites, you'll see how many different addictions they have. Let me just list a few things for you concerning addiction. One in four Americans are nicotine add addicts. They are dependent on smoking. One in six Americans are shopping addicts. They always have to buy or to be buying and take advantage of every sales event. One of every seven Americans are addicted to the internet surfing and role game playing. That's those little games where they sit down and somebody over there in Port Barry or whatever, and they can play against each other online there. These uh, war games or whatever. Basketball game, football games. One of every eight Americans has a significant addiction to alcohol or drugs. One in nine Americans are addicted to porn. One in every ten Americans are, addict, are addicted to gambling. And then there are those who are addicted to sugar. Food in general, sports, 
and the list goes on. So you look at that and you say, well, that's not very good, is it? But in the context that Paul is going to be using it here, it is in a good context. So it's okay to be addicted or to be devoted to ministry. As soon as, as early as 2016, 48.5 million Americans used illicit drugs or misused prescriptions, prescription drugs. And around 66% of more than 63,000 drug overdose deaths in 2016 involved a, pre a prescription or illicit opioid. According to the ASAM, ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, a short definition of addiction is as follow, follows, according to them. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunctional in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathology pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. Addiction is characterized by inability to consistently abstain, impaired, impairment in behavioral control, craving, diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behavior and in personal relationships, and a dysfunctional emotional response like other chronic diseases. Addiction involves often involves cycles of relapse and remission. Without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, addiction is progressive and can result in disability or premature death. <whistles> Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? Well, now, this spontaneous faith that every, I believe every Christian should have, and when I mean spontaneous, you ever heard of the knee-jerk reaction? Once so the doctor takes that little tool, I don't know, what is it called, Jan, you know? He takes that little, I call it a little hammer, and he hits that joint right between that knee and that kneecap, and that, and that foot just flies out like that. The knee, well, it's just reaction, isn't it? That's sort of like what he's talking about. It ought to be spontaneous for every Christian to be addicted to ministry, to be devoted to ministry. Notice, they were also among many of the first converts in Acacia. So, back in that book of Acts, we see where Paul spoke to these Greeks. And remember, that's all they did at the, at the Areopagus. They stood around all day long, and they tried to figure out what was the latest fad, you know, who was wearing this, and what was the latest discovery, you know, scientific discovery, what was the, the latest technology, you know. It was, they sat around and did it all day long. And so, Paul went to these Greeks, and he began to start telling them about salvation that God loves them and about this unknown God that they didn't know. I mean, they had a bunch of gods in Greek culture. And even today, people have a lot of, you know, gods today. But then they had a statue right there at the opening set to the unknown God. So Paul took note of that. And he said, look, I'm about ready to tell you who the unknown God is that you are curious about and want to know about. And after he got through telling them about who the unknown God was, who created them, some believed, some resisted, and some said, we'll talk about this another time. Well, the ones that believed were those in that area that got saved, that Paul had led to Christ. And you know what, folks? Let me just say this. God saves the hardest of people, the hardest of sinners. No matter how resistant a person might be to the gospel, let me just say this. You, my friend, Christian, were resistant to the gospel at one time also. But it didn't stop Paul. And so he understood that these individuals needed to hear the gospel. Whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord would also be saved. And not only was it spontaneous concerning what Paul is referring to in our relationship with the Lord, but you know what? There's something else that really sp should be spontaneous. It's this spontaneous devotion. Okay, spontaneous love for the Lord, spontaneous fellowship to the Lord, but this spontaneous devotion. Look at the end of that verse, in verse 15. He says, let me read the whole thing. Now, I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Acacia, and that they have devoted themselves. See that word devoted? 
That's where I get the word, this is where we get the word addicted. Devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Who were they serving? The saints. Listen, they were in a lot of persecution that day. Christians were being nailed up on a cross, being tortured. Paul was one of them at that time. When he converted to Christianity, he understood that he was doing the wrong thing. God had to show him that. But for the most part, Paul is saying here that these individuals that he's referring to, they were addicted to serving the Lord. Now, let me just say this. As a result of them being priority and their priorities to being addicted to the service of the Lord, to being devoted to serving the Lord, guess what? They were devoted to serving God's people. Remember now, it all hinges, hinges on verse 14. Loving one another. And when you love one another, you will be what? You'll be devoted. You'll be in service to them. What does the word devote or addict or to be, or to be an addict mean? Let me just give you a few of these uh, Bible definitions here. First of all, let's look at the Strong's Hebrew. Maybe some of you have it. Hebrew and Greek dictionary. Believe it or not, in the Greek it's tasso. That's what the word is, tasso. Everybody knows what tasso is. Huh? Ooh, it's not that tasso. It means to arrange in an orderly manner. That is, assign or dispose to a certain position or lot. An addict, appoint, determine, ordain, set. And this is another one of my favorite dictionaries, the Webster's Dictionary of 1828. To apply oneself habitually to devoted time and attention by customary or constant practice, sometimes in a good sense. So, when we're looking at this word, it's referring in a good sense, a good addiction, a good devotion. Okay? And then he says, also in this same definition, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of of the saints. And that's the only place in the Bible, in the New Testament, that it's used in that context. More usually in a bad sense, to follow customarily or devote by habitually practicing, which is ill, as a man is addicted to intemperance. Intemperance meaning self-indulgence and greed and that sort of thing. So we know this. So many people are addicted to so many things. And you know what's sad? We have Christians addicted to so many things that are contrary to the will of God for your life. Uh-oh, I'm stepping on some toes, I know it. But we have to see it. In order for us to realize what God says concerning His will for your life, just like these saints, we have to make some changes in our life. And I can't think of a better way of being addicted to ministry addicted to service, addicted to the things of God. And I love that word now. Before, I'd look at it with contempt, and I would say, man, there's so many people hurting because they're so addicted to drugs and all kinds of other things that destroys their lives. But now I'm looking at it and I see in a different context. How? In a biblical context here. That encourages me. And, and if, you, if you have a hard time with the word addiction, use devotion. It means the same thing. So don't be hard on yourself. Maybe I like it, and maybe you don't. Well, use the word devotion. It means the same thing. So, what Paul is talking about here is just to have that spontaneous devotion. I don't want to have to have someone tell me to do this. You see, that's why God gave preachers. <laughs> to, bring, to cause you to be mindful of who you need to be devoted to. It's not the preacher. It's to Jesus Christ. And it ought to be spontaneous. So what were they to, to be devoted to? Well, service of the saints. He says that. The word service, diakonio, it means deacon, servant, attendance, ministry. You know, again, uh, looking at that word, that's all it simply means. In the first century, we saw where the Christians were Paul, and, and not Paul, but Peter and all the other apostles. As they began to preach the word of God, they saw that there was a great need. Because people, thousands of people were coming to Christ, poor and young, mostly poor people, uh, deprived people. And they needed assistance, so they needed somebody to help feed them. It's really a, it's really a, a, a deacon, it's someone who waits on tables. 
That's really what it means. And, and so, again, when he's using that same term here of service, that's what the word means, that we should be of service to whom? To saints. So these people who were coming, that Paul was introducing to these Corinthians, he said, look, they're not apostles. He didn't make a reference to them and say, well, you know what, these are so big, big people that are coming. You've got you to roll out the red carpet for these folks. No, they're ordinary folks. But they're servants. They're saved. They're blood-bought. They're Christians. So you need to honor them. You know, this idea of just picking and choosing who you want to honor. You know what, that's, that's petty stuff. That's clickish. we call that. And unfortunately, it's in many a churches today. So the word service really, really basically is what it means. So what qualifications did they have to serve? What did they need in order to serve? <laughs> what kind of qualifications? What kind of mandate from God qualified them to serve? Did they need somebody to lay on their hand, put their hands all over them and qualify them to serve? Well, let me just show you a few things. Number one, they were not elders, deacons, or high-ranking religious officials. Paul never said anything about them being in that position. He said they're, they're just they're, they're folks like you and me, servants. And, and he mentions them. Of course, they've got a name in the scriptures here, so they were very important to Paul. And he wanted those readers in that letter, even today, to understand they were very near and dear to him. He cherished them. Also, the word observe, the things that we need to observe and, and note in these things is its function, not the f office that matters. It's function. Functioning in the word, functioning in the church, functioning. It's not so much to see who's going to be on the top, who's going to give the orders, who's going to be the head honcho. You see, and unfortunately, you got a lot, still got a lot of it going on today. That's what's going on in their church. And, 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 and basically what did Paul was writing these last for? He's telling us, stop doing all that crazy stuff. Stop doing like the world. Stop treating the church like it's a secular business. Folks, every one of you are important to God. There is no lesser Christian in this building or any other place that belongs to the family of God than in a circle of Christianity. We're all the same. We're all blood-bought. We're all in the same position, positionally with God. He loves you. He loves you just as much as he loves the person sitting next to you. No more, no less. That's our God. So, and it's a function. If we're to function within the body of Christ, and certainly we need to know what our spiritual gift is, but it's not the office that matters. Because he's not referring to any office here. What else? It's service, not to be served, but to what? Serve others. That's what really counts. Think about that. I think one of the lowliest positions, and Jesus demonstrated that, right? The washing of the feet of the disciples. Didn't he do that? That was the lowest thing you could ever do in a society, was to wash somebody else's feet. He did that. Our God did that. To demonstrate what? His service. He came not to be served, but what? To serve. Now, you know what? If every Christian got a hold of that, man, things would be different. But what, what do we want? We want to be served. We don't want to wait on tables. We don't want to serve others. Now, I'm not talking about this church, but I'm just saying, in general, that's the mindset of what we believe here in America. Is to see how fast we can get to the top and how many servants we can get to serve us. But it's service. That's the blessing. That's the privilege we get to serve. There's no limit to serving. You can do as much as that as you'd like. But you see, there's something in the back of our mind that tells us we don't like to submit ourselves in those areas, do we? Because why? Makes us look bad. Makes us look like we're not important. <laughs> well, I could think of a bunch of them. 
But that's just a couple of observations. There's a third one I thought about, and it's leading by example, not avoiding insignificant tasks. Leading by example. I, well, look, folks, I'm going to tell you, don't attempt any of these things without being filled with the Spirit of God. Because the first thing you want to do is sit back and take a look and say, look at all the stuff I do around here. I told you about that guy one time that wanted to prove himself, right? Guy worked in a church, deacon in a church. One day he wanted to show me all the things he did in that church. Pulled out of his wallet, and he unfolded in a little accordion style, about that long, I kid you not, in small print of all the things he did around that church. And I thought about that, and I said, well, why? I said, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to say? You see, let me just say this. I don't know your heart, but I can know pretty much what I think and how I look at something like that. And you know what I thought about? I'm trying to gain acceptance with men rather than God. When you have to resort to that, to get approval from man, you're barking up the wrong tree because it's flesh. It's carnality. And let me just say this. If you're doing that just to please men, guess what? You'll never be able to please them enough. Amen. Aren't you glad that you serve a God who's already pleased with you? Why? Because you're in Christ. And he accepted everything that Christ offered, even his life. So if you're in Jesus today, you're already accepted 100%. If you blow it, guess what? He still accepts you 100%. But let me just say this. There are no insignificant tasks in the kingdom of God, folks. None. No insignificant task. So when I'm wanting to be used of the Lord, then guess what? I have to be that example. You know, I use this all the time when I'm at work. I said, look, I'm not afraid to stick my hands in a toilet. I'm not afraid to unstop a toilet or to clean a floor. I'm not ashamed to do that. I mean, why should I be? Why should you be? Why should you be ashamed to do insignificant things that you think are insignificant? But by the way, the Bible tells us to do everything as what? As unto the Lord. What? For His glory and for His honor. You don't think He sees that? You don't think God notices every little thing that you do every day? But if I'm doing it with a griping, complaining, bitter spirit, see, that's of the flesh, that's of the devil. You don't get any reward for that. But by leading an example, being that example, just like these Christians were, in the face of persecution, every job, every devoted thing they devoted their hands to, they did it by example, and it was never insignificant, no matter how menial a task it could have been. And then fourthly, it's leading by submission, not lording it over others. You know, sometimes people get in a position and say, oh, you know, everybody got to do what I tell them to do. Well, what? Where do you get that from? That's up the devil. Now, I believe you ought to have order and you need leadership. That's important. But not to lord it over people. Some people, you just give them a little bit of authority, and boy, and it goes to their head, doesn't it? <laughs> Give them an extra set of keys, man. They just go, woo, I'm somebody, am I? Someone has once said, many work, few toil. Now, this is a beautiful picture here. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, just bear with me because there's, an, there's important lessons here. And, and I'm just going to share this one point. I have to get through reading it. So make, I'm not going to make too many comments on it for the sake of time. But Ephesians chapter 5. You really see a beautiful picture here. It's a, there's a coordin coordination between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Always will be. There will always be an agreement. One will ever be six, any less than the other. They're in unity with one another. So when you read things in the Scripture, remember God's always in agreement with Jesus. Jesus is always in agreement with God. The Holy Spirit is always in agreement with both Jesus and God. So there's always unity there. There's never disunity between those three. Verse 20, Paul says, giving thanks in all ways for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 20. 
Now, he gives this beautiful picture where? In the home. And he starts by saying in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. See, my wife is obligated to me and to no other man. Men, you have a wife. Praise God you have one. She's obligated only to you and no other man. So if you have something you want to say to my wife, come to me because I'm over her. She's part of me and she's obligated to me. So whatever critics or whatever kind of criticism you want to offer, come to me. I got big shoulders. I can take it. But here, he uses this beautiful picture in the home concerning wives. Submit to your own husbands as notice to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and it is himself his Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, please don't take any of this stuff out of context, okay? Because there's nothing in here that says a man should lord it over his wife. Please. And so he gives the example of Christ and how Christ was submissive to the Father and how he led by example to those of us men also should use that same terminology, that same object lesson, that same way of loving our wives in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just say this, Christians. If a man is in truly in love with Jesus Christ, he will never abuse his wife. Oh, Please, don't miss, don't miss this. If a man truly loves Jesus Christ, he will never be disrespectful, disrespectful to his wife. Understand that. So when people, these liberals, lib, women's lib movement and all that start saying, oh, you know, women shouldn't be submissive to husbands, you know, people just so diametrically opposed to the word of God. That's, I understand that. So the only person that's going to make up their mind is God, is Jesus Christ, concerning what truly submit, being submissive to God means in the context that it's written here. Lovingly, as verse 24 says, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. See, again, God understood that women would automatically love their wives, but men wouldn't do that. That's why women always want to hear their husbands say, I love you. Because men don't just don't ordinarily do that. That's the way we hardwire. Because of sin, see? You know, guys, you hear that all the time, don't you? Do you really love me? Do you love me? <laughs> they want to hear it. But not only do they want to hear it, they want to see some action. See? Something to back it up with, guys. And look, I'm talking to me too here. So don't think I'm just throwing this out here to get at you or make your wives all stirred up when you get home and they'll start getting on. No, 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 no. But husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and notice, and gave himself up for her. Now don't miss this verse. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and the word. Why? So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blame. You see, this is what Christ is doing in the church. To present the church spotless, blameless, without blemish before God. That's why when you sin, Christian... And, sa and Satan comes along to accuse you. Boy, the, in, boy isn't, he, isn't he dynamic right now? In a worst kind of way? Looking for sins 30 years and 40 years ago, and even those who wanted to be elected as a Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, going back 30 years to find a sin that he committed. But don't you see, that's the accuser of the brethren. That's Satan at work in full light. And notice how many people bite on that. But you see, Jesus Christ did this. For you, Christian, the day that you got saved, every sin has been forgiven. Past. Present. Future. And you say, how can that be? Because we serve an eternal God who offers an eternal salvation. 
who also offers forgiveness for your sins and restoration and cleansing. And you know when Satan ever, he brings up those little stories in my mind about some past event, I just say, you know what? One day God's going to turn that furnace on you. It's going to get a little hotter for you. So you're just reminding me of what to remind you of what's going to happen to you. And you need to remind them of that too. Because I've been blood bought. Yes, I was guilty. Yes, I was destined for hell. But by the grace of God and by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I've been forgiven from my sins. And I'm restored only by what Jesus Christ has done. For by grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves is a gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. So if you're trying to work your way to heaven, guess what? You'll never outdo Jesus. Verse 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blame or blemish in the same way husbands, notice guys, should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife, notice, loves himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. Submission. And then thirdly, think about this. Spontaneous submission. Uh, you know what, Christian? I should never have to be told to serve God. I should never have to be told to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ. I should be addicted to fellowship. What do I mean by that? Well, what, simply what Paul is saying here. Stephanus, notice his word means crowned. Fortunus, fortunus means fortunate. And acacias means belonging to. Notice the names of these folks. Notice the kind of people he surrounded himself with. Dedicated, devoted, addicted Christians. Boy, that's, boy you know what? Boy, if we had more of those folks, huh? They're people just like us. They're people that didn't have titles. They didn't hold certain off, big, huge offices. They were just servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were addicted to the things of God. Amen, Brother Tony. But I wish you'd stop using that word. I'm not. Because it's, it means a great deal. In a positive way. In Philippians chapter 2. Verse 25 through 20, 26. Paul says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. Look at all these titles he's given him. And your messenger and minister to my need. See, a lot of people were just abandoning him. Hey, listen, you attached your name to the apostle Paul. You, it was a death sentence for you. Did you know that? I mean, listen, it was bad enough you said you were a follower of Jesus Christ, but to say you were a follower of Paul, an ex-Pharisee, who diametrically now goes against those things that the Jews considered were eternal life. Many of them didn't believe in the resurrection. Many of them didn't believe in an eternal body that one day you would receive. And, and Paul was going around preaching and saying, and now he's Epaphroditus saying, I believe all those things Paul's saying. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? You became a big target. Because naturally, you're going to tell other people about this. Notice verse 26. If you're there, he's in verse chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 25 and 30. He says, For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and I, I may be less anxious. See, Paul felt those same, same things we felt. Maybe you're anxious about something today. Maybe things just not going your way. Verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. It's a servant. 
for he nearly died, notice, for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what he was lacking in your service to me. Here's a man risking his life for the gospel in service to Paul. I mean, today we get up, we come to church, <laughs> there's no pressure. You come if you want, you don't come if you don't want. A lot of people just don't care to come to church. They call themselves Christians. Or they go find a place where they can be comfortable with their sin. Hey, I mean, whatever. But then he's saying, I rejoice, verse 6, 17, back in 1 Corinthians. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Acacius. And because they have made up for your absence. Okay, again, now, when do you get encouraged? Where do you get encouragement from? From God's people. I come to the church because I want to be encouraged. I want to be able to build you up in the faith, not to tear you down. Build one another. How you can do that? There's a lot of ways you can do it. Prayer. You can pray for people. Pray for me. Please. I pray for you. I don't believe there's anybody in this church that's any kind of need, dire need. See? And if there would be, with the, that's what we're here for, to help. To support one another. This is not just a Sunday event. event. This is seven days a week. So he's commending these folks. He's letting these Christians know in Corinth, listen, they are valuable to me. They are assets to me. And for the work of the ministry. That's what the church is all about. We consider everyone the same in the eyes of the Lord in the church. Secondly, Paul informed the Corinthians of uh, the Corinthian church that these individuals had refreshed my spirit, as he said in verse 18. And they did. They refreshed him. They encouraged him. Verse 18, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Notice what he says. Give recognition to such men. Recognize them. Many of them hadn't met them. But I want you to treat him as you would treat me. And encouraged him, refreshed him. In Proverbs 25, 13, I love these two verses. It says, like the cold snow. Boy, we got, <laughs> it's been hot. Boy, a little cold snow out there would help cool things off, huh? Like cold snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the souls of his master. Or the soul of his masters. Verse 25, same chapter. Like cold water to a thirsty soul. Boy, you know, in his hot days and you got that cold water to help quench your thirst. He said, like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. You know, in those days, I mean, they didn't have internet. They didn't have Fox News, CNN, all those other news outlets. They had to rely on word of mouth, letters. And so when they received... Y'all, some of you have been old enough to know, you get with some of these little love letters in the mail. Remember when you used to date your wife, your spouse, or your bride-to-be? And she'd send you that little perfume letter in the mail? That was sweet, wasn't it? Huh? Oh, you see how much they miss out today? Can't sniff a phone. <laughs> Can't sniff an email. <laughs> I told someone the other day, I said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to burn all those cell phones. Amen. Go back to the landline. Amen. The old rotary dial. Amen. Some of you saying amen. Some of you voice. You know what? Some of you can't go one day without your cell phone. I'm serious. You're so addicted to that phone, you cannot go one day without that cell phone. Right? Am I right? You come on, admit it. You might as well come out clean and say it. You know it's true. So you addicted to that phone, aren't you? I don't want to start putting out everybody's sins here. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 and 7 says, But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. See that refreshing? 
and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. Wow. That's beautiful, isn't it? And I love 3, three John, chapter 1, the only one chapter. Verse 4 says, Paul, John says this. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Folks, you know how much of a blessing that is? Parents, you know how much of a blessing that is? Grandparents, you know how much of a blessing that is when your children are walking in truth? Now, he's referring to the church here, but we could put all these people in here too as well. But as a pastor, there is nothing greater than to see a child of God walking in truth. And unfortunately, we have so many people, Christians. Now, if this was a message for the secular world, I would say we could go back to that definition from Sam. You know, from the... the that, um, psychological, all that other stuff there. We could go back and use that and keep people more confused. <laughs> if it would work, but it doesn't work. What works? Jesus Christ. Once you get a grasp of who Christ is in your life and who you should truly be addicted to, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I get on fire. Somebody this week started talking about how he believed that he saw how people, how could people not... How could people turn from the gospel? And I got, man, I tell you what, it's like he lit a fire under me. And I got to him and I said, let me tell you something. There's only one man who overcame the grave bodily. And his name is Jesus Christ. If you can tell me, and there, whoever it is, whoever else is it that turns away from Jesus or turns away from this gospel, if you can tell me of anyone else who's done that, who's overcome just the grave itself, who died, died a real death and went in a tomb and came out from it, I might believe you. I might change my mind about Christ. But can I tell you something? No one's ever done that. And there's only one. And his name is Jesus Christ. I got on fire about that. I tell you what, you, we talk about Jesus, I can sit down and talk all day long, which would bore some people. Perhaps even some Christians, it would bore them. Why? It's because they're not addicted to the things of God. This is where it's happening, folks, for Christians. Everything else compels in comparison than doing the will of God. Why? Because the things you do in this world are transient. You're just passing through and you're going to leave it behind. If it's not, if Christ is not doing it through you and you're not in the will of God, yeah, you'll be saved, but you're going to miss out on a whole lot of rewards. I got a little bit of homework for you. <laughs> and I got a challenge for you. This week, now, it's going to be tough. It's not for the faint of heart. And I'm not going to put on a little, you know, I'm not going to patsy with it. And I'm not going to play like it won't be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But I got a challenge for you this week. It's between you and the Lord. Today, starting today, let no unwholesome word come from your mouth. And let me give you a scripture verse that you can remind yourself of, or even, if you want to be a little bit more bold, memorize this verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Now don't try this, don't try this in your own strength. Don't try this in your own power, because you're going to fail. You probably fail by the time you walk out the door. But I want to challenge you to meditate on this scripture and maybe just memorize it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Here's what it says. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, 
but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it now if you're having trouble with this verse just remember let nothing come out of your mouth don't let anything come out it might be up in here but don't let the century of your teeth let it come out don't let any unwholesome corrupt communication come from your mouth only what is useful for the building up now I'm talking to me too okay and let me tell you there's a lot of people that want to play the Holy Spirit because of this but I just ask you to meditate on that verse that's that's your challenge for this week you stand